Mark Boris, and this is Straight Talk. Don't ever be a midget, it's too hard. <laughs> Grant Patterson, welcome to Straight Talk, mate. I am a short person, midget, little person, dwarf, whatever you want to say. If you think not let the little things affect you, think about how much happier you will be. When I see people overcome adversity and do something that's outside their comfort zone, it makes me so happy. We all have choices, choices on whether to fold, call, or to raise. Pick the raise car and make something from nothing. Fuck, is it up in cans? Yep. Man, there's crocodiles up there. I oh, know. Still be midget grills. <laughs> <laughs> Grant Patterson, welcome to Straight Talk, mate. Well, thanks for having me, Mark. We uh, met up in um, Cairns uh, about, I don't know, it seems like forever. Uh, back in May. Was it May? It wasn't yeah. only that long. It, was, yeah. it actually feels like it was sometime last year. Yeah. Um, and uh, we were both uh, guest speakers at a function, um, which was an interesting function. There were a lot of, like, there was a stack of guest speakers. I can't believe the the headline sort of speakers. Um, like, it was pretty impressive, actually. Um, and... Uh, I talked to you and I said, you mate, come down and do a straight talk with me. Like I thought it would be pretty cool. Um, and before the show, um, this show, we are just chatting then about um, Graham Patterson, otherwise known as Scooter. And how does he best describe himself in terms of what you do from day to day? Well, I'm hoping I've got Worlds next year. Uh, well, Manchester- this is a World Championships. World Championships in Manchester. And I'm, I'm chasing that elusive gold medal, try and beat the Mexican. Um, I've also started up another hobby, go-kart racing. So hopefully I uh, pursue that a lot more as well. Um, but in the meantime, try and be that advocate out there to let everyone know that it doesn't matter what uh, hand of cards you're dealt at birth, you can get it out there and have a go and do the best you can. It's a difficult concept for a lot of people to get their head around because how did Grant make those decisions and where did he – get the guts and the courage to make those decisions. I mean, so if you could take me back to, say, when you were younger, Grant. Very interesting question, Mark. Big thanks goes out to my two parents, Steve and Shelley. They were the ones that never wrapped me up in bubble wrap. Um, I see a lot of families today, a lot of parents that have a kid with a disability and they tend to, because they might be missing a leg or an arm or intellectual problem, they'll tend to wrap them up in bubble wrap and not let them go out and experience the world like every other kid. Uh, but my parents, they didn't do that. They got me out there in the dirt with me mates, playing with me other friends. I remember one time I was with a mate down at the creek and we're in a rubber ducky boat fishing for a little black brim. Anyway, we got three or so in the boat, and because they were jumping around, the dorsal fins popped the boat, so the boat sunk. And my mate, because he was a good bloke, he had me on his shoulders, had the boat and the rods in both hands, and we were walking towards the drop-off point where my dad was going to pick us up. And he, I remember his words saying when he drove down, all we could see was my mate Tom carrying me, and here am I on his back, you know, and he's like, that's cool, you know. My son is different, but he's out there experiencing life. You know, something happened and they made it work. Fuck, is it up in cans? Yep. I mean, there's crocodiles up there. I know. <laughs> like in my swimmer. You know, like. <laughs> Call me midget grills. <laughs> <laughs> we get bear bear grills. grills. Grill. Well, yeah, what's interesting, you take the piss out of yourself. Um, yep. Is that a thing you've always done or is that, thing, is that learned behaviour? No, that's the thing I've always done. And I think to, you know, when I was in school, I remember, you know, I get bullied. Uh, not all the time, but, you know, you got certain people at school that are bullies. Mm. And I remember my, my parents saying, you know, you haven't got arms and legs to reach them, so you got to play in your own way sort of thing. And obviously that's with my words and either ignore them or throw back a smart line, but then let them go. Um, and I've never taken anything about my physical appearance to heart. Like, just for example, I just use the word midget. A lot of short people hate that word because it hurts their feelings or it's not what they are. But at the end of the day, I am a short person, midget, little person, dwarf, whatever you want to say. It's just a word. And what I tell a lot of people out there, if you think not let the little things affect you, Think about how much happier you will be throughout the 52 weeks of that year. I never let anything like that affect me. That's why I'm doing all my training. I'm working. I'm doing my go-kart racing. I'm, I'm just full of life. But I don't get, let the little things get to me. Do you think it's because your parents maybe 
yeah, sort of exerted tough love on you. In tough other words, love, exactly. Have you ever spoke to your parents about it? No, it, it's just I really think, honestly, my parents weren't uni degree people or anything like that. They were just old school, like my dad's parents and my mum's parents were tough on them and they just did the same to me like what their parents did to them. When I back backshattered my mum or my dad, I would never do it to my dad because he pulled the belt out yeah. and belt the crap out of my butt yeah. and that hurt. Old school. Yeah. And and meanwhile, a lot of people probably look at that and go, oh, how could you do that to that little person? You know, he can't help it or he can't defend himself. No, he needs to learn that when his father says, no, this is how it is, that's how it is. No more batcha. And I remember back in the day I used to, to fight him a lot, but I learned and I'm so thankful that thankful for that because it's made me the independent man I am today. I'm so thankful for them full stop. Independence really important one because I actually don't see you with a disability, but I do see you as a shorter person. Mm. You know, you compete at everything, mm. and uh, you know you can't take a bigger step as me, perhaps, and you probably can't reach out as far in the pool as maybe I could. But it doesn't matter. You within your class of of competitor, you compete in everything you do. So did Mum ever say, "Oh, what's your dad's name?" For Steve, name? Steve and Shelley. Uh, uh, Steve. Yeah, maybe you've been a bit tough on Grant, you know, like, can you pull up? There was times after we had our arguments and discipline actions where afterwards, you know, he would say, mate, I love you to bits and I don't, it hurts me to do this, but you can't do this and I'm doing it for your own good. And that's the part that really, you know, there was never no haste. It was just him disciplining me. And then afterwards, you know, he made sure he realised that you don't do that. That's not right. That's not how you talk to your mother. You don't talk to me like that. And that's how the world works. And it definitely wasn't like a, a horror house or anything. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. It was just good old discipline, which has disappeared in the younger generation today. I think you would agree. Yeah, well, I have four sons, like, and uh, they were, all of them were a nightmare in different ways to me. Um, and I was a sort of a single father. I have to say now that, like, I did not spare a good whack for my kids if they deserved it. That's it. I don't give a shit what anyone says or doesn't like it or whatever. I mean, they're none of them are scarred or sort of upset. You know, they're all fine. I don't think there's any reason to, because society doesn't accept this, there's no reason to put them in a cotton wool and, and keep telling them everybody owes you a living. Correct. Because at the end of the day, no one gives a shit. Correct. And you've got to go out and make your own trouble. You know, stand for something, be skilled at something. Now, you have developed a skill, which is you're a naturally funny dude, but you've got an unbelievably good story to get off your ass and do something about it. How the fuck do you keep doing that every single day of your life? I mean, where do you get the gumption? I ask myself that question sometimes. I, I've come back from Portugal and I've got nothing now until next year. So when you say nothing, you've got no more games no until No more year. swimming racing, yeah. doing go-kart yeah, yeah, racing, yeah, 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 which yeah. is totally different, but you need to be fit for that. So I've told my coach, I said, I'm just going to do six sessions. Swimming in yep, the pool. Well, two gym, four swim, and just take it a bit easier in the afternoons um, because you also, I think what I've learned over the last four years of my swimming career is you only live once and you've got to make, a, make the most of every moment you have on this planet. And, for example, I've just done my major comp in Portugal a month ago. In the next six months, I want to enjoy it a bit more before it ramps up before Manchester next year. Um, but the word that you said before about how do I do it, I, I ask myself that question because me sort of doing the six sessions now after I come back from Portugal, I have about two weeks off, it's like, oh... You know, and, and I'm looking to try and make Paris, LA, and then the end goal is 2032 Brisbane. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but. 2032. Yeah, I know. That's, 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 that's 10 way. years away. But no, that, but that's a 10 year plan. That's yeah. cool. But it's, it's like, I don't know how it works. And I just tell people, it's like this mongrel inside my head. And, and it could be an enemy of me one day, too, because it just doesn't know when to stop. It just. It's just hungry for success. And I think that's a good thing in a lot of ways, but also in other ways of sort of settling down, you know, maybe finding a partner one day. Because I'm so hungry to reach the top of that mountain, um, it can scare people away sometimes as well. But I do enjoy what I'm doing right now. Um, I wouldn't have it any other way. Let me give you an example of 
how my brain works. But this is an example. Any other person with a disability like me would have struggled last night. I got to Sydney at 10.30. I got to my apartment on um, William Street and there's literally, well, there's a button about at your head height. So I'm up on my handlebars on my scooter trying to push this button because there's two flights of stairs to get to the apartment. I'm like, oh, what did I book this for? And I hit the button. I said, hey, mate, um, can you open the door and where's the lift? It's like the concierge. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And he said, oh, yeah, I'll open the door and just walk up. And he hung up. So I hit the button again. Hey, mate, I can't walk upstairs. I'm going to need a hand. He said, oh, I'll come down and show you. So he's come down. He's put my bag inside. He'll walk upstairs. He said, can you go up this hill, up William Street? You explain how William Street is very steep. Totally. <laughs> yeah. And so he said, you just got to go up there and come down Premier Lane. And this is like 10, 30 at night, tired, got my backpack on. Yeah, I'm a swimmer, not a, a mountain hiker. <laughs> <laughs> Here I am ploughing up this hill late at night and I'm just like, what am I doing? But, you know, that's that's without my resilience that I've been through the last 30 years in my swimming life and all the challenges I've overcome, um, like, for example, missing out on Rio, that was a big, big taste of resilience to me. And I think about when I was walking up that hill last night, I was thinking about all the, the sad times I've had that, and I got through them and I was like, this is just another challenge. Piece of piss. Yeah. Do you think it's your resilience has come about as a result of your swimming career? Yeah. But yeah, it has. It has definitely. And like, not, not your wins, your no, losses. No, 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 no. That's, that's probably the most rewarding part. It sounds weird, but it's probably the most rewarding part of my swimming career because I went to London in 2012, didn't, make, didn't get a medal, made final. Um, I, I got over the fear of failure there and also learnt how to stop con- trying to control the uncontrollable. And then obviously Rio, I wanted to get a medal, come Rio, missed out on the team altogether. Um, and then I remember after I got told by the manager uh, that I missed out, I was at home. I called my parents after training. It was about 7 o'clock at night. And I was just annoyed with the world because Paralympic swimming, I'm not going to sit here and complain about it, but it's never going to be a, a fair a fair lane of people because everyone's different in my class, Yeah, yeah. which is understandable. Anyway, so I said to my parents, oh, I was fuming and I was angry and they're like, Grant, you have two options. Option one, you can ring up the current affair or whatever you want to do and complain to the world that <laughs> Paralympic sport is unfair and the classes are whatever you think they are, or two, you can go back to your drawing board, know what you're up against, and if you so happen to to do well and make Tokyo and win a medal, we're not saying you are, but if you do, think about that story you'll get to tell. And I remember at that point in time, there was part of my competitive brain that said, no, we should be on the team of Rio. This is rubbish. But then the other part of me said, the independent side from my parents said, no, think about this story. If this works, it'll be sensational going from London, no medal, Rio, miss out, Tokyo, silver and bronze, 13 year in the making. Think about that story. So you, you I was wanting one medal. I got two. The what could be was stronger than what, was. Yeah. I shut my mouth and went back to work. Yeah. If there was an opportunity there, I was going to be there to collect it. And that's what happened. When you, you know, missed out in Rio, the next one in line is Tokyo, which got delayed a year, of course. COVID. Yep. When do you train? What time of day? So I wake up at 4.45, yeah. in the water at 5.30 till yep. 7.30, and then go to work, and then back at the pool at about 5.15, 5.30 till 6.30. Two sessions a day, probably yeah, training seven day. swim, two gym, so nine sessions all and, up. Okay, nine sessions all up, all up. So you're waking up for five years. Well, 13, but... Well, no, but uh, post-Rio, uh, right? Yeah, up five to, years. Leading up to Japan. With the prospect, by the way... You could fuck it up too. You might not yep. get to Japan. Yep. Yeah, you could have had. And, and then the whole COVID thing come into it. And and you I had remember. COVID sitting on top of you. Yeah. So you're up there in Cairns. Are you train in Cairns? Yep. Fucking alarm goes off um, and you jump back in the pool. And I, look, guys, I've done something. It's like 
to be honest, like it's you buy fucking yourself. hard work. Yeah, you buy yourself. It's both of you looking at that line, yeah, <laughs> you're going up and down, fever. and you get in your own head yeah. because there's no no music. You don't can't put nope. headphones on. Um, you can't talk to your colleague. You can at the end of the at the at the end of the lap, perhaps, yeah. but you know, I'm too busy. You're but you're training doing what I'm doing. And so if you're training hard, you're yeah. pretty fucked. You're, you you're, not, you're breathing. You're, you're gasping. Yeah. <laughs> so, and you got your goggles on, and. Uh, What's your head saying to you when you're going up and down the pool? What are I'm you saying always, to yourself? I'm always thinking about what's the next obstacle I'm going to overcome, anything like with work or with what I'm doing with myself, with my management team or even like my go-kart, you know. I've only just uh, got my go-kart trailer set up and there was a while there where I was thinking about how we're going to set it up. I do a lot of thinking while I'm swimming and I, I like it to be happy thinking because when I'm not happy about something – I tend to, you know, not focus enough on, on what I'm doing in the water. And then it takes your, your happy focus away, which I don't like to do. Uh, but swimming is definitely, uh, well, medically and physically it's good for my body. Yep. But mentally it's great because you go in there, there's no one around, no one can call you, nothing like that, and you pretty much come out refreshed. When I when I wake up in the morning in winter, it's the worst because I'm like, why am I hopping out of this warm bed? And but when I finish at seven thirty, it's like that's good. Yeah, I'm ready to work for the day. You know, I keep myself busy because that's the way it stops me thinking about shit stuff that's shitting me. Well, it's funny you say that. I'd say no because I still think about the shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And sometimes if I'm not happy about a decision that's been made, I'll still hop out of the water angry, and I go home thinking about it. Yeah, yeah. But I'll never, I'll never showcase to people, and I'll never. I'll never do the wrong thing by anyone else. I might talk to my coach, oh, you know, I've had a shit decision today at work and, you know, we'll have a quick chat and um, off I go. But I'll never lash out or anything. But I'll, I'll, yeah, I don't think it definitely doesn't fix it for me, but it takes, I think, takes a lot of that. Because you got to understand a lot of people – it's hard for them to understand what a real successful sports person goes through because for me to do what I do in that water five, seven, nine times a week for the last 13 years, my coach explains it well. What we go through and what we have to take on board as in mentally when we're doing a hard session, like I turn into this monster and sometimes <laughs> that monster gets de- uh, suppressed better in the water, if that makes sense. Because when I'm doing, say, a hard set that goes for one hour, back to when we're talking about growing up, being tough, love, all that crap, a lot of that independence helps and the resilience helps fuel this monster to get through that one hour session. Because a normal person would last five minutes. You know what I mean? You know what swimming is like. It's hard. The breathing, the pattern, and then doing it for an hour, like a hard aerobic set, you need to be. It's grinding. Yeah. And, And to be able to do that, also, when you leave that session, you have to be able to calm him down and put him away. And, like, I work a, a customer sales job. I then have to turn him off, go to work, and go, hi, how are you? How can I help you? Well, does that mean then, Grant, that you're good at compartmentalising your life? I think, yeah, I don't know what that word is, but I yeah, well, you say, sounds good. Okay, I'm going, to, I'm going to go train. Yep. Train. Train's done. Block that off. I'm now going to go to work. Mm. Now, work on customer service mm. and uh, I've got to be, Grant, the friendly dude. And I can't be kind. Yep. Sometimes I might be able to pick myself up yep. And, yep. and talk to you on the phone, all that stuff. Um, but, yeah, it's completely different where a lot of athletes don't work and they go home and rest and, and I understand it. It's a very it's a very hard thing on the body. Yeah, but so because I want more in life, I'm doing more. Do you think you have more physical pain and or because you know every sportsman has pain they get injuries all the time do you think you suffer more than a say a normal sports person who's like fucking you know one of these olympians yeah, or yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. The non-paralympians whatever the word is no. i mean do you, do you feel as though you do you get injuries like that's, that's a good question and if you if i was to put you in my body you would suffer tremendously but over the years i've adapted to it and i've built up I built up a tolerance. Yep. My, my, part of my disorder, diastrophic dysplasia, is obviously a short stature, short limbs, and curvature of the bones and lack of cartilage in all my joints. In all your joints? Yes. So, so you've got arthritis. Yes, pretty much. But because I'm 
used to it. I don't actually know any better. It's funny how your brain adjusts, yeah. adapts. Yeah, but it, I remember when I was starting, it was hard work. Even like having a couple of days off and get back into serious swimming. Like the other the other week, because I haven't done a serious swimming since before I left to Portugal, um, I was happy for this young fella. I normally smash him in the pool. He, for example, I'll do a 75, he goes a 125, and normally I'll cream him, but I got beaten. <laughs> How'd you feel I was, that? Oh, inside, I was hurting. I was like, oh, I want to get back to nine sessions. Screw, screw this six session bullshit. Let's get back on fire. But it means I said, Grant, we're chilling out for six yeah. months, remember? Let's build. Slow down. We got 10 years, mate. Let's build. Slow down. But, and I was happy for him because he beat me. And I was like, mate, when he shook his hand, I was like, congrats, brother. I said, that was a great session. I said, I was chasing a whole way, but I just didn't have it. I mean, you could easily say be filthy on the world and have no gratitude, yeah. just be fucking dirty all the time. Well, I think it's very important. I'm very appreciative of being able to roll around on this planet for one, but yet to be able to go and do a full session and challenge another, like, for example, how I just explained how we set up that session. I did 75 metres, so I did 125. Yeah, being able to do that stuff, um, I think also – being accepted by my peers. Um, but no, gratitude is a, a big... Is this something you work on? I mean, if you get it's, dark... It's, it's, it's natural, I think. I think going back to my parents, the way they discipline me, respect elders all the time, please and thank you, and you'll be tre- treat others how you want to be treated. And I don't, I don't like having enemies, uh, but obviously, you know, you, you you have times where people might do the wrong thing by you. But I like to work it out and, and make a solution. And and if they if if the if the two people don't want to fix it or resolve it, well, then you go your separate ways. But you don't need to sit there and fight about it. I mean, you know, there's a lot of all these people talk about meditation yeah. and all that sort of stuff. I, I get it. I, I fall get, asleep. <laughs> yeah, so do I actually. But like, uh, it, but, it, but it's good. It's a good thing. But and and meditate with gratitude and all that sort of stuff. But that's people. It's sort of like people training themselves to have gratitude, mm. to, to actually to feel appreciative, as you said. But is it fair to say that you're naturally appreciative of everything that comes your way? I, and is that because you might have thought at some stage, I'm never going to be able to come a swimmer, then all of a sudden you thought, shit, I can be a swimmer, I am a swimmer. Not only that, I'm a, a medalist at the Paralympics. You know, when I was little, I remember one of the things my parents said is, you have to be very respectful and appreciative when people help you because if you know there's going to be a lot of people that want to help you, Grant, and if you don't show your appreciation, you're going to get a reputation of oh that, that little fellow was rude to me or I never want that to happen ever. And I get a lot of people. I'll be at the shopping center at Coles and I'll be throwing my shit up on a conveyor belt, and I'll have people. Oh, can I please come help you? Can I do that for you? I said, no, mate, I'm fine. Thank you very much. I said, if you want, you can come home and mop my floor. <laughs> That's a joke, you know, spice it up. Did because you, life's too short, look at me. Do you get, do you get awkward moments, many awkward moments? No. You never get awkward moments? No. Well, I mean, do other people get awkward moments with yes, you? Yes, big time. And no, what, oh, what do you do? I don't know what to say. I'm really sorry. I said, mate, don't be sorry. I said, you Kinda are actually a very helpful person, but I don't need help. I enjoy throwing my shit up on the conveyor belt. You know, I've been at work all day. I'm doing something different. Yeah, yeah but like, how do you deal with other people's awkwardness? I mean, I mean, I just, I just say, do you just say sorry a, and and how do you calm them down or let, whatever you call it? Yeah, let them know it's okay. Um, I just said, but, but thanks for offering. You know, it's a nice gesture of you. Um, do you ever get dirty and say, "Listen, fuck off"? Um, like, I'm no. sweet. I'd never. How do you control all that? Those emotions. Sometimes a little. I'm a little bit. I never, never swear anything like that. But sometimes a little bit upfront. Like I was on a plane yesterday, hopping off the plane, and I had a a lady with an impatient husband who was he was waiting. And, you know, you get those people who are just wagging at their tail, get off the plane, and then she was there being polite, obviously waiting for the movement of the traffic, and then she's going to offer me a go. Meanwhile. She didn't know I can walk. And then I had an old mate beside me wanting me to go. And I said, sorry, mate, I can't walk. You go. And then obviously he didn't hear me, so I explained myself again. And then I waved this lady on. Mate, you go. She said, oh, what about you? I said, no, I can't walk. You go. Yeah, and I was very tired and over it. So, but, you know, sometimes 
Well, not come across as nice, but always try and be clear of whatever. Can Never take, fuck can, off. Can you take you your scooter on the plane? I go on the plane yeah. domestically. Yeah. Um, and they'll whip it underneath after I hop on the seat. Yeah, well, interna- in the yeah internationally, it goes in the, oh, the the baggage thing. Overhead up lockers. Yeah, okay. Sometimes it goes up in business class, and I say, "Hey, hey, baby, you put scoop back in the economy, and I'll go up there. I'll have the <laughs> peanut colitis." <laughs> but so, so, so you, you, they have to give you a wheelchair or something like that to take no, you. you no, can just on the out. scooter. On, no, no, on a domestic oh. flight. Oh, no, 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 ride on yeah. and I jump off a seat and then they carry it down. Oh, the, they take yeah. it down the back foot yeah. or something like yeah. that. Okay. Yeah, really okay, nice. Okay, sweet. Yeah. Okay, and it's the same same doing work, pushing this wheelchair back and they don't know how to push. I'm looking at it. It's pretty fucking old. Um, yep. Tell me the deal. What's the deal about your it's scooter? It's probably done about 50 million miles. But tell me the deal about you. Whether, who, who made that? So like, there's a story on it. It made it back in, I think, 2010. How it all started was... There was a bike before that that was made, a year before that one, and that was made by one of my friends and his mates at school. And my brother was in the year behind him. Your younger brother? Yeah, my younger brother, a little bigger brother, Mitchell. Anyway, the bike that was made before Mitchell made my aluminium one was a solid steel one. It was like a downhill funny thing. It weighed about eight, nine kilos. And I, I loved that they made it for me, but it was heavy to lift in the car because yeah. how I drive, I um, have all my mods set up, but I lift the bike up over the steering wheel and put it in the passenger seat. Yep. You ride shotgun. Someone wants to sit there, they can either hop in the trail, they move it and go back <laughs> up to them. <laughs> so anyway, I uh, mentioned, well, obviously my parents and my brother knew that it was a bit heavy for me to lift over. Um, and so me brother Mitch in manual arts in 20, well, he was in grade 12. and I think school. Yeah, well, I yeah, school. Yeah, yeah. And I think it was 2010 or 11, he made me the aluminium one. So he made that? Yeah. And I've actually, I've still got a heavy one. It's at home. It's inside white. So I keep the house clean inside and then that's my outside work. Yeah, because it looks like it's done some miles. It's done miles and everyone says, why don't you give it a paint job? But whenever people hop in my car and put it in the back of a ute, they don't tie it up properly and get scratched. You get scratched. So, you know, I said, you know, they're here to talk to me, not the scooter. If they want, they should talk to the scooter. So I, I know you've got a beard. Yep. And uh, at the moment, but I think when I saw you up in Kansas, I'm not sure if you had a beard. It might have been a seven o'clock shadow. It might, it might have just been a little bit like I pretend to do yeah. sometimes. <laughs> That's but, your man. But I, as I understand it, one of your processes, yep. let's call it superstitions. Traditions? Process. Is like it Rafa. a superstition or a tradition? Oh, no, a tradition. Tradition oh. is that you grow a beer when you're training. Yeah. Yeah. So right now you are in. Well, I'm Not trying. quite yet. Yeah. Into the serious end of the world next year. Okay. And then Paris 2024. So, yeah, so 2024. So the world's next year is is that important for you? Do, in terms of qualifying Stepping for, stone, yes. Is part of the qualification process? No, but it's it's good to be able to know that I'm, I'm doing well leading up towards um, Paris. Right. So know. do you know the dude who you got to beat? I do now, but so for example, next year we'll have trials in April. Everyone will have everyone else around the world will have trials before June or July, and then you get a rough indication of who's going to be there. Uh, but how they pick the team is my swims next year in April will be recognised of the times at 2022 in Portugal Worlds this year. Right. So right. I'll just have to be. Beating your times I did this year. So how did you go in Portugal this year? Just tell I'll me. I'll be honest with you. I didn't swim as good as I wanted to right. compared to Tokyo. Um, but And I remember I touched the wall in my main, well, one of my main events. I got a 50 breast and a 150 IM. 150 IM was, I got a bronze medal, which I was happy. I was over the moon for. But my time, I remember I hit the wall uh, and I looked up. I was just like, Fucking hell, what is that? You know, to myself. Yeah, yeah. But by the time I got over to lane eight or whatever to hop out of the pool, I said, Rent, it's a swim. I said, after today, no one will know about the times. I said, you've had worse things to deal with. I said, be happy with the bronze medal. All the things I've learnt along the way in my swimming career, when you win a medal, you'd be happy. Tom, yeah, that's my own personal thing I have to deal with. I'll go back to your drawing board and work on it. But you just want a bronze medal for your country. There's people back home that aren't even, aren't even on the team, so pull your finger out of your bump and be appreciative. And, you know, I give myself a, a pep talk sometimes, you know. 
Give yourself an uppercut. Yeah, surely. Focus. Even yeah. though I was pissed off that time, give myself an uppercut to say, be happy, put a smile on your face. You just want a bronze medal for your country. Not everyone in Australia gets to say they've done that. So, but what are your, what are your dreams beyond all that? I mean, what do you want to do? Where do you want to end up? I want to be a person that try and help change society to be a better place and to get off their ass and make something of themselves. Not getting everyone, their parents do everything for them all the time. Not relying on, for example, NDIS to do everything for them. Look, look at me. I know you don't think I'm disabled, but I can't walk. Yep. I don't. I live by myself, have a full-time job, I have my own house. I don't have any NDIS. I have a lot of people say, why don't you have NDIS? It can help you out. I said, because... To me, when I sign up to something like that, it's taking away that can-do attitude. I mow my own lawn. <laughs> I whip a snip. You should see me whip a snip. I hold it above my head. A lot of people <laughs> say, that's unorthodox. I know. But I'm doing it. It's me. I'm not relying on anyone. And who knows how long that NGIS thing will last. You know, and when it gets cut eventually, probably one day, Think of all the people that rely on it. You're going to be screwed. Where if I know that sounds really harsh, and I'm really sorry for all those people. No, out no, there, that's right. It's right thing to but say. But I'm serious. When it when it gets cut or when it gets taken away, all those people and even the people that get help from Centrelink or whatever, they struggle. And you know, like what happened with COVID, everyone got handouts because they lost jobs or whatever. And now it's back to work time. No one wants to work because it's easier. Sitting there doing nothing. So are you de-risking your life? Is that what you're doing? I mean, is that is that what is that I your strategy? I was risking, but I'm being independent, and I like to think of myself as a valuable member on this planet, just yeah. like you. Yeah, you're doing totally. what you've done. Totally. And and I know a lot of people don't see living that way, but to me, if you want to be on this planet living, you need to make a contribution. So, as a valuable member, which I consider you are, but as a valuable member member of society, what do you want to leave? Behind, what do you want to pay forward? Well, I'll leave a legacy that doesn't matter what hand of cards you're dealt with at birth, that um, we all have choices, choices on whether to fold, call or to raise, um, to go out there and pick the raise card and make something from nothing because you know, life's too short to sit back and sit there wondering, uh, I really would like to be a doctor or I'd like to be an actor. Go out and do it. Yep. And and that's why that's why I like or doing things like this and doing motivational speaking is to inspire people out there, not just to settle for second best, but to inspire them to get them off the butt, to go out and let them know that it's up to them on how far they're willing to climb to reach their goals. Because a lot of people play, play the not fair card. Mm. It's not fair. Which you know, is rubbish. It's, you know, like I was born a certain way. It's, uh, my parents were no good or, you know, I was uh, not genetically, you know, blessed like uh, Hussein Bolt or something like that. Don't worry about the not fair card. You know, forget about that and right, I mean, get on with it. Yeah, I think what you're trying to say is, and a lot of people have said, Grant, you're very lucky. I said, yes, I am lucky. You know why I'm lucky? It's my two parents. Not everyone's had parents like me. But I hope by me sharing my story, it can help inspire and give them that extra boost to go out and chase their dreams. That's what I'm wanting to do. But is swimming, it can... swimming is a stepping stone for me getting a platform to say blah, 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 blah. The swimming, to me, for you anyway, is a, is a way of building awareness of who Grant Patterson is. You know, like everyone, oh, I, th- I know, I know who that dude is. I've seen him, and he calls himself Scooter. He nickname, and he's on a scooter, and uh, and he wins all these medals. I get that, uh, but that's just an opportunity for you to talk more. You feel as though you're obliged to do because you've been so lucky. A famous quote on a movie: "With great power comes great responsibility," and I think me in a position where I am with swimming, I have an opportunity not just wish for me, but to change the way people think. And I really would like to do that. And i got mates back at home, younger younger mates, that I help out. And when I see them, like the fellow that beat me, when I see them do something awesome, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be big, like we were just training, so I say nothing big about that. But when I see people overcome adversity and do something that's outside their comfort zone, it makes me so happy. And, and having, you know, I, I like, 
buying fast toys and doing all that stuff, that makes me happy. But this stuff is like a natural adrenaline. Like it's cost no money, there's nothing involved. But I've watched I've given them a bit of help and I've watched them go over that that pressure zone and to see them do well, that makes me proud. And it's a bit like you know, how my coach and I work. He he's ecstatic to well, I'm ecstatic to be with him for thirteen, fourteen years and same for him I would say. It's just like with my, my personal trainer, Karina. Um, just very open, open, happy, loving, caring people and like seeing people succeed. And I would like to, when I finish all this swimming stuff, I'd like to be in a position one day where I'm some sort of mentor to help people. Because like when I was in Portugal uh, a month ago, a few of the younger athletes were a little bit down about their performance. Even though I had my thing I dealt with, but I washed it out before he even hopped out of the pool. I was there telling them that, you know, it's okay. You know, you've done this right now. You've got a silver. I know you wanted a gold, but it's not to be. And I, I re-educated because I got this advice when I was in London 2012 by the psychologist. Your friends and family, everyone back home, they're going to still love you the same amount whether you got gold or six or bronze I said, as long as you put in your your maximum effort, that's all that you need to do. But when you're an athlete, when you're younger, you get held, you get caught up in all the, the limelight and the medals and all that. And you know, if if you don't get a medal, you're gonna be shit. Because that's what I used to think Dude, when it, I was younger. It's funny, you know, like it's that 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 sports psychology thing is pretty bloody important to all sports yep. people. But most sports people, and probably most people for that matter. But the most successful people, I think, um, do have someone they've always looked up to. Is there someone that you've always – do you have people well, in your life like that? I look up to everyone, literally. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say my parents. But apart from that. Because I don't like to – I like to treat everyone the same as me, where a lot of people when they're at the bottom, they get starstruck by people. And, you know, I've met, met certain people in life who are well accomplished, but – at the end of the day, just like you, you're well accomplished. You prick our skin, we're going to bleed. We're mm. all the same. Made of bones. Totally. And yeah. Um, but probably one of the, when I first started, um, a fellow by the name of Matt Cowdery, just how he took himself in the pool and outside the pool. Um, he's a family man now, back in Adelaide. Uh, but no, he was a, a well-respected athlete and... What I really loved about him is he put in the hard work and he got results, where sometimes in Paralympic swimming, that's not how it happens. But for him, that's how it worked. And I think he he was a good role model back in his day and still is for other people going on in their career. Um, but he was probably one of the ones um, that I sort of looked up to in a way. Uh, but when you go to Paralympics, it's it's really special. Um, you know, forget about myself, but there's people over there that don't have their arms or their legs and the way, you know, they eat food or dress themselves, it's amazing. You know, it's a real eye-opener. And I, I do recommend whenever the, when the Paralympics comes on in two years' time that all the people out there that aren't sure of if they can do something or not, they need to watch that because... Watching a fella put goggles on with his feet, you know, most people can't even touch their head with their foot, let alone put goggles on. Um, <laughs> For sure. Yeah. So it's, uh, I, I've gotten a lot out of not just the whole swimming discipline training side, but experiencing a lot of adversity, diversity. Do, do you think um, we should rename the Paralympics just, just call it the Olympics. I mean, is that an issue, or is it just, no, is it right? No, and I think this is probably a little bit controversial to like how I talk about who cares about midget, or whatever. But no, because Paralympics is different to the Olympics. As in, you got the Olympians who are amazing people, fastest people on the planet. The Paralympians, they're not the fastest people on the planet, but they're the people that have a physical, some intellectual challenge. They go out and do their best. So I think it's good having it the way it is because, well, I find a lot of people say that 
Paralympics is more inspiring than the Olympics because you got people not only get o- getting over or going through their disability or whatever it is, their challenges, but then they train on top of that. Yeah, well, so, I find that incredible. Yeah. And and it's, it seems to be, to me, do much more popular today. I noticed the Commonwealth Games that are, are on at the moment, they've, they've combined the two yeah. the two groups. Yeah. Um, it's no longer Special Olympics or whatever you want to call it uh, to well, me. Yeah, that's still there is still a Special Olympics, and that's for intellectual people, right? But Paralympics is we all got our brains, and we all have physical obstacles in front of us, and we have to make the most of it. Yeah, so it's about people overcoming, let's call it adversity, yeah. in in day to day. Yeah, but it's not just it's not just getting in the pool and doing well, as you said earlier. It's, it's about the extra effort that it takes to train and stay committed yes. every single day yeah. and you train as much as a normal uh, Olympian yeah. who might be doing, you know, two sessions a day, whatever, yeah. five days a week. So, um, but, you know, they don't have to catch planes and struggle on planes. It's, it's just an extra struggle yeah. all the time. You've just got to do something extra all the time. You know, yeah. like as you said, you're trying to press the button. Yeah, and it, 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 it was just extra effort yeah. and you've got to have a certain brain a certain developed brain. For me, I know it's about everyone was talking about the physicality of the yeah. race. Yeah. Get it, we'll get all that part. But yeah. for me, what I like about it is the brain power. Yeah. The extra brain power, the extra um, effort your brain has to put into yeah. it to build. It's not just resilience, but it's a process. There's yeah. an extra process. Correct. And your brain has to develop much at a much at a different rate to some boy or girl who's naturally gifted, as I said, like Hussein Bolt, mm-hmm. who can run in nine seconds, but no matter what, even if he didn't train, he'd probably still run in ten and a half. doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, the real blessing is that someone like you can actually get through the extra effort. Yeah. That's it's the intellectual blessing that you have. There's an intellectual ability that most other people don't have. Mm. And like, for example, a fella with no arms putting his goggles on with his feet. You go to a swimming, learn to swim club in Sydney, and I bet you, ninety nine percent of the parents will be putting their little kids yeah. goggles on, and they <laughs> totally. got their arms. Yeah. How are they meant to learn? Yeah. Oh, but he's tired. Who cares if he's tired? Get them to do it himself. That's yeah. what my dad used to do. You got arms and legs, even though know, I couldn't walk like my brother could. Do it yourself. Yeah, that, that's a. That's, you I, do each other favors, but. At the end of the day, you got to do it yourself because he, I remember him saying, when you move out, Grant, and you told me that you want to live by yourself, yeah? And I said, yes. How are you going to do it if you're not used to thinking of a way around things? And I just quickly want to give you an example. At work, I've got a hairdressing stool that goes up to, I don't know, four foot, whatever, and I'm about your height on it yep. and it's on wheels. So I'll cruise around the counter. If I drop something... It literally takes a minute to go back to my bike, go down, hop on my bike, grab it, throw it back up, hop back up, hop back. That's me. And when I do that, that, that mumble inside goes, oh. and sometimes I make a joke to the customer, don't ever be a midget, it's too hard. Because <laughs> literally, I have to stop what I'm doing, go back down, pick it up, and throw it up. If I've got someone there, uh, another sales rep beside me, oh, you grab that one and Easy. But for me, everything everything I do is I have to work. And I remember when I first started working there, because my dad used to own it, own it, but he sold it three years ago. But I remember when I first started working there, I said, Grant, you're different, you know that, but it's nearly like, and this is, how I, and this is probably why I work so hard and, you know, that, that mongrel inside me is so strong. He said, you nearly need to work double the speed to keep up with someone that's got arms and legs, which is correct. And and that's how I work. I, I look at myself. I I take snapshots sometimes going, why are you running? But it's because I'm running to the chair to get on it and get back the same time it would for you to walk from the back to the computer. There's sort of an efficiency mm-hmm. that your brain has to and work out. And I am out. a fish in the sea. <laughs> well, but, 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 but and you're also a joker, which, by the way, is an interesting sort of characteristic that you have. Apart from taking the piss of yourself, you you have this um, ability to lighten the mood, and, 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 and but, but that's pretty cool. But there isn't an uh, there isn't an efficiency, intellectual efficiency that 
people like you have to develop. Mm-hmm. In because, as you say, if, if I drop something from Joe Lynn and pick it up, you if up. you drop something, from G, you have to go back to your scooter, go and pick it up. There's an efficiency, an intellectual efficiency, because and it'd be fucking frustrating because yep. I mean, and then there's another efficiency that you have that allows you to deal with the frustration. So you know, you can't be walking around dirty on the world. Because you just have to go back to get on your scooter to pick that thing yeah, up because it's, no one it's there to help you. I, I do it. Yeah, okay, so that, that, that's another efficiency. There's these intellectual efficiencies that you build that I never will have to build, um, and I think they actually equip you to be able to deal with whatever might happen. So when COVID happened, you know, all of us so-called um, non-disabled people, whatever the word is. Yeah. Um, we all of a sudden got put in a fucking weird position that we'd never been in before. Whereas we, you know, we couldn't live our normal life. We couldn't get in the car, drive here. We could catch a bus, train. Where we go? Where we had to stay home. We had to do this. We had to had to rearrange our house. Had to you know make sure we did our work. From and all of a sudden we got we got challenged uh, in a way that we've never been challenged before. And most people will fucking shit themselves and yep. uh, you know pretty much start complain and you know blah blah blah. Say so someone like you, you used to dealing with this crap. I, you know what? I actually loved it because you know why? It was I still got the train. I ended up uh, getting myself a bit of a deal with one of the pools. It was hush hush for the six months. I was only doing four sessions, but it was something. And I did say to myself, if I didn't get that pool, like sneak in, I was going to go to the creek, freshwater creek, tie myself to a tree and swim in the rapids. But I ended up getting the pool. But that year of Nothing happening. I enjoyed it because there was no, it was just me training and there was no expectations. Like when I go to trials, there's expectations of me doing a certain time to make the team and then there's expectations for me on myself. Pressure. I, my, I have my own pressure. My, my expectations and pressure that I build in myself is higher than anyone else's because I know where I want to go on that mountain and to go up there I need to be Doing well all the time. So I actually enjoyed the year off. Um, and, like, let's talk about another example. For example, a lot of people were worried because they might have had a house and they're paying it off. But something that my parents taught me was always have money saved up because when there's that rainy day, yeah. you don't know what's going to happen. Me, I know I'm very lucky, got the parents, but I was fine. I was, I was hoping that we got kicked out of work. <laughs> so I'd sit at home, actually started up doing piano lessons. You know, that's something else. I'm like, oh, Grant, I'm not doing as much now because of swimming. Let's do piano. It's like, Did you start okay. playing piano? Yeah. And that, how do you go? I can't reach everything, but I do a pretty good job. Yeah, I was yeah. doing that at the Adelaide Airport, playing a bit of um, clocks. Elton John and Chris Martin inspire me in that. Uh, yep. I love them. I've seen seen both of them live. I haven't met them, but it'd be awesome. But um, I was just having a humble, having a little play at the Adelaide Airport on that piano. And one of the fellows was watching. But I, I get the biggest smile on my face when I can nug out a song because I think it's part of the reason why I do the motivational speaking. I love... I like entertaining people in a way, and and sometimes my talks I get carried away, and obviously I get to do a few jokes, not on purpose. It's just me taking the piss out of myself, and I realise what I just said. I said, oh, you know, um, but um, but, I but just, it seems like there's nothing in your mind, nothing you can't do. Yeah, and that's what I like to portray to people. But is there is there some wish that you've always had? I'd like to be a singer. Because my voice box isn't just going for singing. I'm like a cat in a bucket. But I reckon I would rock the crowd because I've got that that I don't know, energy and that buzz and the character like Elton John and all that to just, you know, carry on like a fool on stage. But you're I, a performer though. Yeah, but I think I can't you're a natural sing. performer. <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't matter. I mean like Lennon Cohen couldn't sing. He, he sort of I even of do murmured everything, but mock like, up things, you know. But I just love I love being yeah. Part of the party. I don't want to say life of the party because I don't go out. I, I just like being out there contributing, having a good time. Well, what is your social life like? What, what do you do socially? Like, <sighs> like you live, when, you live in, when you're at home in Cairns, for example. Well, for example, like I went down Adelaide for my mate's 30th. That's probably the third time I've had a drink since I've been back from Portugal. I don't go out and drink much, but after I've done a main event, if there's something on, like a mate's birthday or something, I'll go out and have a few. Um, but what I love the most is going out on a dance floor and having a boogie. 
Um, That's cool. Yeah, and I, I see a lot of blokes. They're like, oh, you saw all those chicks. I never, I never have a win, but it's because I think uh, people that like to be out there and have fun attract other people that with a similar mm. ingenuity, if that's the right word. I think that is And, and I don't go out there fishing for birds. I just go out there and have fun. And because I'm having fun, I want to have fun with you. Yeah, well, pe- well people like yeah. light, I mean, especially when they're in the entertain- going to be entertained or going out for fun. They want light. Yeah. I mean, people don't want heavy shit. Yeah. I mean, no one wants heavy shit. I mean, but maybe some people do, but generally speaking, most people don't. They want to have, make a nice light. I'm the same. Yeah. One of the reasons I don't go out is because people sort of bombard me with yeah. they want to talk about the economy or something yeah. thing, or Sorry, mortgages no. or something. And uh, I, and it's it's heavy for me. I just want to yeah. talk light. I'd rather just talk about how the Sydney Roosters went or uh, yeah. how we, you know, what's going on in State of Origin or something like that. Uh, are you a footy fan? AFL, AFL, Brisbane Lions. Brisbane Lions. The Bears. Yeah, but, what, but what about Queensland uh, State of Origin? Yeah, yeah, I, I, watched, I watched the State of Origin. That's about it with NRL. But I'm more of an AFL. How did that happen? Like, because yeah, Queensland. No, because I'm a Clans boy yeah, and I saw NRL up there. Totally. I know. It's like I'm North an Queensland, dude. It's like a like, Victorian not watching AFL. Um, I know. I just watched the game over time and I enjoyed how it flows, I guess. And at, at school, I used to have a little miniature AFL ball and me. One of my English mates and the teacher, he was a Brisbane Lions fan, would get on the on the basketball court at lunchtime and belt the footy to each other and take screamers. Like, you know. So, but, so that, that's it. Well, I'm a Collingwood fan, so everyone Dirty hates pie. us. pie. Everyone hates the pie. Yeah, well, they hate Good us. Good pie like, dead pie. Well, yeah, I know. That's what everyone says. But, like, I mean, I, I know I got uh, I got it sort of inducted into the pies through Eddie McGuire because Eddie and I were, were mates, or well, still mates, but, like, Back, going back to you remember years back ago. in 2002, 2000 and we took over sponsorship of Collingwood in 2000 and 2002 right. and 2003 right. when you lost two in that a row. That was dreadful. That was sad for yeah. you. How did you feel? I, d- I wasn't happy. Yeah. And uh, I'll tell you why. It's a quick story. Okay. As Eddie came along and he said, um, uh, we, uh, we were in, at that point, we were, my company called Wizard, we were sponsoring um, the uh, pre season competition. And uh, AFL preseason competition, and uh, I knew that um, NAB was trying to resurrect its brand, so NAB was always going to outbid us. Yep. So Eddie said to me, um, um, Armand Fahor, who was a friend of mine, Armand was the boss of NAB at the time, and Armand was a mad AFL fan, and um, Eddie was finding out from Armand exactly what was going on and feeding me back, and I was finding out on Saturday mornings when I was at footy with my kids and stuff. And uh, so I let Armand, in the end, I, I knew Ab, NAB was going to outbid us, so Eddie said to me, listen, they're going to outbid you, mate. He said, but uh, don't worry. He said, oh, um, we've lost our sponsorship, which was the RTA, whatever it was, like the Roads and Traffic Authority, the equivalent of that in Melbourne, Victoria, because one of their players had got caught drunk driving. Yep. So he said, you can go on our away jersey on the front and home jersey on the back and we'll put you on there. And he said, look, because we've come last in the competition – or something like it was very closer. He said, um, "It's only going to cost you about a million bucks a year." And I said, "Oh, okay, well, that's cool." Because you know, like that—that that was a fair price for the business. So I agreed to do the uh, sponsorship, and we did the sponsorship. And he said, "But, but in the contract, it said, but look, by the way, if we get to the top eight, we get a bonus. If we get to the top four, we get another bonus. And we get to the grand final, we get a bonus. And we get to the we win the competition, we get another bonus." What I didn't, and I thought, well, they've come last. There's no way it's going to happen. So they, they, they got belted pretty hard and I think it was about 2005 or six that I started this process, this uh, sponsorship and, of course, they got in the top eight. They got in the uh, – then they, they worked their way through the top and they ended up in the grand final and it, the sponsorship went from a million dollars to two million dollars. Yeah. Now, Eddie was my mate. I nearly barred him for life yeah. um, but, but I thought to myself, I stood back and I thought, how clever is that dude? Mm. And and I mean, I know he's not there anymore mm. at, at Collingwood, but the guy was, I for me, I become Collingwood supporter because of it. But for me, the guy's legendary in the way he looked after his club. Mm. Sure, he made some mistakes, but he would do anything for his club, mm. anything, literally anything. And I, I didn't realize how powerful AFL um, fans and or AFL culture was until I experienced that with Eddie Maguire. I mean, it's, it was quite a formidable sort of experience. I mean, sure, it cost me a lot more money. And, we, yeah. by the way, we got good outcomes because, you know, Collingwood, whilst not everyone loves Collingwood, 
they broadcast. Everybody yeah. watches them. Yes. I mean, and you might hate them, but you yeah. still see the branding. Yes, I hate front. them, but they're everywhere. Yeah, but, and uh, totally. And uh, <laughs> but I, I just found it quite incredible how how culturally strong AFL is. I mean, rugby league is too. Don't get me wrong. More so now than it ever has been. I think. Yeah. But it was a great experience for me. I mean, I, lo- I really enjoyed that. But uh, I, 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 we're running out of time, mate, and uh, I, I really appreciate um, you coming, f- you know, on your way back to Cairns through here to, to sit down and talk to me. Mm. Uh, I want to, and I've been thinking about this the whole time as we've been talking, um, and you as, you, as I said earlier, you take the piss out of yourself and you call yourself a midget yeah, and all that sort of stuff. Sure, sure but, I'll, but one conclusion or one realisation I've had from this talk, and I would never realise this until I actually had an opportunity to sit and talk to you, is uh, apart from my own gratitude, being able to understand a lot more how people like you think, Mm. is that I would describe you in terms of the way you approach everything and the way ultimately that you achieve everything. In other words, the process of achieving what you achieve, not just silvers and bronzes and hopefully one day gold and not just independence but I would describe you as a big man. Thank you. No, I mean that. Uh, Intellectually especially. A very big man. So Uh, thanks for coming in. Thank you very much for having me.